Welcome everyone and a uh, very warm welcome to Sarah Nassel, previously of WISA in Johannesburg and a member of this department who's placed in this department since January this year. So we're really delighted to have her here and to start to engage with her thinking as soon as possible. So that's why we scheduled her so early in the year. Um, Sarah has over the past um, 15 years or so made a number of significant interventions into the field of literary and cultural studies in South Africa not least through her many publications, including her monograph, Entanglements, Literary and Cultural Reflections on Post-Apartheid, but also through her sustained um, publication of co-edited collections, which she's convened various kinds of key debates um, in relation to South African literary and cultural studies. These include the collection Negotiating the Past, the Making of Memory in South Africa, and I think almost anybody working on memory or the TRC or anything to do with it has cited at some point or another. Census of Culture, South African Cultural Studies, Beautiful Ugly, African and Diaspora Aesthetics, and Johannesburg, the Loose of Metropolis, that began as a public culture special issue and is now out as a book. She's also recently been very involved in creative non-fiction and has co-edited and contributed to the collections At Risk and No Shedding, both of which are subtitled Writing on and Over the Age of South Africa. And in today's seminar, she's going to be leading a discussion on, with, sorry, some thoughts on the way we read now, which will be followed by responses by Leon Lukov and Daniel Rood. Thanks, Sarah. Thanks, Meg. Thanks so much for the opportunity to speak here today. Uh, I'm going to use the time available to me to um, try to uh, open up a field of interrogation rather than to present an overarching argument or thesis, which I've done elsewhere that I'm not going to do today. Um, and, and by this field of interrogation, I mean a set of questions that I think are or could be interesting for thinking about the future of literary studies in this country. Um, and specific, specifically for us here at Stellenbosch, I want to put things on the table that I think we can discuss, enlarge upon and disagree about, very importantly also disagree about. Um, I happen to think that literary studies has a few problems at the moment, although many of my colleagues in literary studies don't necessarily agree with me. And that may be part of the experience of working for 10 years in the Interdisciplinary Institute, in which I've understood for myself that the reach of the literary has been receding rather than growing in recent years. So I do think that the literary is facing a number of serious problems. Um, in any case, in the spirit of a conversation, uh, a set of exchanges and disagreements, I've asked Daniel and Leon to respond to me briefly. Now, the title for these opening remarks today shadows the title of an issue of the journal Representations. <laughs> Okay. Please do tell me if you can't hear at the back. I'd like to be able to reach you. A special issue, a special issue of, of representations published a couple of years ago called The Way We Read Now. And I want to pick up on that text, um, <clears throat> as well as another text, text which is David Shields' Reality Hunger. And in my view, these two texts are already shaping some of the most interesting questions, challenging literary studies at the moment. For me, they pose two questions which I think if we can answer, we can begin to understand where we're at with critical theory and what we're up to with this, um, the, this practice of literary criticism that we're all involved in one way or another. The first question is whether and to what degree the practice of symptomatic reading, which has been with us from the 1970s, has run its course and become increasingly unable to respond to the wider culture which we inhabit. The second question has to do with what we might see in Shields' formulation as a rising hunger for reality, and not, by the way, just in others, in some risable middle class which we despise, but in ourselves. I'm going to pursue just two points then today, and the first has then to do with symptoms and surfaces, and the second with reality hunger, private public spheres, and affect worlds. Since the 70s, we in literature and other disciplines have been trained to equate reading with interpretation and to base that active interpretation on the acceptance of psychoanalysis and Marxism as meta-languages. The notion of symptomatic reading and of Jameson's very powerful idea of the political unconscious has been even more central than I think perhaps we remember or imagine. Symptomatic reading assumes 
that a text's truest meaning lies in what it does not say, sees textual services as superfluous, and tries to unmask hidden meanings. For symptomatic readers, texts possess meanings that are veiled, latent, repressed. The work of reading is the work of ideological demystification, of detection and disclosure. Two issues immediately arise for our consideration. The first is this. It has been common for literary scholars in the 80s and 90s to equate their work with some form of political activism. Yet certainly as the 21st century takes shape, it is apparent to me at least that literary criticism does not effect change in the world, or at least not as much as it once thought, thus raising the question again about what it does do and why it matters. Secondly, in this new century that we inhabit, the surface seems to be a much more potent space than it has been before. Jameson said in 1981, if everything were transparent, then no ideology would be possible, and no domination either. And he went on to explain, therefore, that interpretation could never operate on the assumption that, quote, the text means just what it says. That position is now clearly wrong. Stephen Best and Sharon Marcus put it very well. Those of us who cut our intellectual teeth on deconstruction, ideological critique, and the hermeneutics of suspicion have often found those demystifying protocols superfluous in an era when images of torture at Abu Ghraib and elsewhere were immediately circulated on the internet, where the real-time coverage of Hurricane Katrina showed in ways that required little explication the state's abandonment of its African-American citizens, and many people instantly recognized as lies political statements such as mission accomplished. As they note, one can make the assertion that while understanding that, that there are still many secrets around, including state secrets, which governments go to great lengths to keep hidden, and where a, a hermeneutics of suspicion might be useful, although WikiLeaks is doing that work pretty efficiently these days, the point is things have changed and literary criticism has not, or not enough. Bruno Latour has been a powerful voice in wanting to move away from excessive emphasis on ideological demystification. He refers to the idea that social conservatives use that mode of reading for their own benefit perfectly well. For instance, they question global warming by referring to it as a social construction rather than a scientific truth. In his essay, Why Has Critique Run Out of Steam? From Matters of Fact to Matters of Concern, he suggests the work of the critic is not debunking, but assembly of redesigning and re-looking. It seems clear to me that when students complain to us that they don't want to study race and gender anymore, it is based on their profound intuition and understanding that the culture has shifted and that earlier work of the earlier work of critique doesn't quite get how power works these days, and that the critic as detective who knows more than anyone else is no longer so convincing. I want to say a bit more about symptomatic reading. It links to what Umberto Eco sees as the idea that words hide the untold, and that the secret of meaning is its impossibility. And we should remember that a hermeneutics of suspicion is Ricoeur's phrase, and he was talking about Freud, whose model of interpretation was especially suited to symbolic language, that is, language where another meaning is both given and hidden in an immediate meaning. That is, meaning something other than is said. And behind Ricoeur, Althusser, for whom texts are shaped by questions they do not themselves pose, questions which lie outside of texts. Rita Felsky notes that suspicion is a curiously non-emotional emotion, an asocial emotion, synonymous with a professional culture which values detachment. It is linked to mistrust. She calls it, and I like this phrase, a low-grade affective stance, suspicion. Suspicious reading, she says, is an exercise in plotting. And the realist text is seen as fraudulent, as a deception already doomed to fail. There's always a kernel of antagonism in suspicious reading. It is not, she says finally, that suspicious reading kills a text, but that it induces a shadow of banality, pays too little attention to its potential pleasures and its affective sides. It's also true, of course, that symptomatic reading keeps asserting itself. Suspicious 
reading, when we try to think about other ways of reading, it keeps on showing up. So I want to turn now to the question of the surface. If we do at least in part want to abandon um, a hermeneutics of suspicion and a reading for depth and a symptom, well, what would surface reading look like? Now, for Jameson, surface reading is taken to be obvious and superficial. Readers who attend to the surface of the text are seen to be ideologically complicit readers. But some critics are now asking, along with Latour, and following the wonderful in intervention of Elaine Friedgood in her work, Meanings in the Vic uh, Fugitive Meanings in the Victorian Novel, no, sorry, The Idea in Things, Fugitive Meanings in the Victorian Novel, which I remember so distinctly reading in Johannesburg in 2006. Um, how we might conceive of the surface as something other than a cover for depth, okay? And may even have some of the qualities of depth, for instance, originality, dramatic power, self-assertion, a capacity <coughs> for melodrama. Now, in all of this, and this is a joke, by the way, Jameson's readings <laughs> begin to look rather cold war. What a text means lies in what it does not say, which can then be used to rewrite the text in terms of a master code. Now, it's interesting that the first wave of um, reaction to symptomatic reading came from what has come to be called the history of the book. And I would like especially to talk about Leah Price's it narratives here. I think she's doing the most exciting work in this terrain. Um, in, in which she diverts us from the interiority of books towards their materiality, and reforming them in a vivid object hood, whose surfaces, far from being inert, become animated spaces for lively consideration. Um, but I think the history of the book doesn't really get us where we need to be with this question of the surface of the book. And I want to mention, um, using again Marcus and Best's text, some other kinds of ideas for reading the surface. And I'm quite attracted <coughs> to Anne Chang's work, where she says, well, instead of being a suspicious reader, why don't we be a susceptible reader? Why don't we make ourselves susceptible to the text? Why don't we look at the surface of the text rather than through the surface of the text? Why don't we stay closer to the text, being less resistant, less masterful readers? The text doesn't have to be decoded to be understood. And we can embrace this um, loss of critical certainty and embark on a project of unraveling. Now, isn't it interesting? This is what Susan Sontag said in 1966 in Against Interpretation. She said, look, interpretation does not disclose the text's true meaning, but alters it. And she, she advises us to show what the work is, even that it is, rather than show what it means. Attend to the text and to one's effective responses to it. For me, it's tremendously interesting that Virginia Woolf, on her marvelous essay on being ill, which I happen to be teaching downstairs at the moment, talks about the same thing. She says, look, when you're really sick and you're reading in bed, a whole lot of things about the text become clear to you. And you kind of get, you sort of lose all these critical lenses that you otherwise in healthful life would use. Um, and you start to think about the rashness of the text, its sensuality, its sounds and feelings. In other words, you become an affective reader um, a, 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 as, you, as, you, as, you, as you think um, a, a, and read in bed. Um, be that as it may. Sharon Marcus, um, who with me shares a great interest in celebrity culture, um, calls it just reading. That is, finding the things that symptomatic reading has rendered invisible. So if you're so busy saying how in certain novels marriage ends, stops, lesbian relationships, you completely look, forget to look at the way in which female friendship is all over the text. So what we read for and how we read for excludes a whole lot of other things. In other words, make yourself open to the potential of the text. And this doesn't have to be antithetical to critique. But it does get us past the impasses of ideological demystification. 